for the sake of having somewhere to start, let me just share these um, ugly notes that I took. So I literally just like wrote this <laughs> myself, but you know, now we, we have something to, to talk about. And so I guess maybe like the way we can do this is I'll just start by like reading through my current understanding of the transaction life cycle. And then anyone can jump in and like, and please do jump in at any time. And, uh, either like correct me or ask a question or, you know, or, or whatever. Cause sometimes I've come on here and felt like I could speak pretty authoritatively about whatever we're talking about. And today that's only like a little bit true. So, okay. So here we go. Like we start out with the transaction being created by like what I called in general, a user agent, uh, a transaction is going to be created. It could be something really simple. Like I want to send some tokens to Peter or it could be, you know, like I want to vote in an election, or it could be, um, it could be a weirder thing. Like we'll we'll talk about some weirder ones, like an inherent in a little bit. It could be like I'm a block author and I'm authoring this block, so I'm going to set its timestamp or something. And those ones start a little different, but I think maybe for the sake of getting the the basics down, we can start with this these like normal ones that are created by like human users of the chain. And, um, you know, I think like in general, there should be a lot of user agents and I think there will be, um, especially like once Polkadot launches and, uh, and all that, but like the, the one that most people seem to be most familiar with right now is like Polkadot.js apps. Okay. So great. Like I use this web form to enter in my information, send six tokens to Peter or whatever it is. And then the user agent encodes it in, you know, I think in general, this could be in any data serialization format, but definitely the substrate chains that I know of use the, this, um, this scale codec that Parity published and it's a good lightweight one. And, um, you know, kind of like Daniel was saying, like, <laughs> this is a thing you don't probably want to stray from too much unless you have a good reason to just cause you're going to stay on the happy path that way. Um, true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Um, and then, oh. okay. So, so then once your transaction itself is encoded, then we can add any amount of, uh, additional data and the additional data is stuff that's it's called like signed extension and um, basically it's any data that can be used to help validate or invalidate a transaction that's not part of the transaction itself so like if we stick with my example of i'm going to send six tokens to, to peter then like the the transaction itself doesn't really have to include that much information it needs to include peter's address it needs to include the number of tokens and uh, maybe some other things I'm I'm not thinking about, but like not that much stuff. But then I include all this additional data, which sort of protects me as a user from uh, any any number of bad things. So like one of the ones that is popular in Substrate is that I can include the Genesis block hash of the blockchain that I intended this thing for. And that's useful because if there happen to be two similar Substrate chains out there, I might be trying to send Peter six tokens on this particular chain and then someone takes that transaction and also executes it against a different chain. And it's like, now I accidentally sent six of each kind of token and I didn't mean to do that. Um, or another example is there's this thing called longevity where like, you know, I know the state of the blockchain right now and given the state of the blockchain right now, I want to send these tokens. But, you know, you can imagine that if for whatever reason this transaction doesn't get included, like in the next day or two days, like, I might want to reassess. And so I can include like, um, I forget, I think uh, like, forget the vocab, it's called like era or longevity or something, something like that. And basically it says like after a particular block, then this transaction is no longer valid. Um, and so all this stuff happens client side. And then, you know, the last thing that happens for most transactions, definitely for these like normal sort of user generated ones that I'm describing, then it gets signed with your private key. And then that's sort of like uh, that's sort of like the birth stage of the the transactions, and from here they go out into the world. So maybe I'll just like pause right there for a second to see if anybody has any comments or corrections or questions or anything. I'm curious: uh, is this additional data standardized in some way, or is it sort of free form for the chain to decide what to do with? Oh yeah, that's that's a great question. So let's like uh, let's just dig into some code. It's sort of, I think the answer is sort of both. It's standardized in the sense that there's a trait that describes it, but it's free for the chain to customize in the sense that it can implement that trait however it wants and even like multiple times. So um, I guess just to like help everybody get oriented since I just jumped right to the middle of a, you know, multi hundred line file. So I'm like, I'm in the main substrate repo 
and it has this folder called bin, which includes two demonstration nodes. So there's like the full node, um, which you might have seen. And then there's the node template that people like me and other people who work on Substrate Dev Hub and stuff like that really shill as like, this is a good, good example, a good place to start your chain, like, you know, copy the node template and then start hacking. And so I guess I'm, I'm like specifically looking at its runtime file. And so I, I know a lot of you guys have written runtime. So maybe I'll just give a little context. Oh, I can't get my scroll bar to work. That's okay. So like, uh, here's where I implement the trait for all of the all the palettes and then here's the construct runtime macro. And now we're scrolling down into this less well-trodden area <laughs> below construct runtime. And um, so it says like the signed extension to do the basic transaction logic. And so this is the thing I'm talking about. This can include uh, additional data. So like, here's the one I mentioned where I include the Genesis block. Oh er yeah, era is the right one. So this is the one where I say like, this transaction's good starting at block N and it's good for, you know, uh, like X blocks after that or something. Um, here's another one that makes a lot of sense for frame runtimes. Um, in frame runtimes, the transactions are a lot like Ethereum where every account has a nonce and you have to execute, like, you know, I have to execute my transaction with nonce one and then nonce two and nonce three and that prevents things from happening like out of order or transactions from being skipped. And so like, most of these ones come from the, the system palette, which means they're going to be pretty reusable across all your chains. Um, and then this one doesn't. This one actually comes from the uh, transaction payment palette. And I, uh, I don't think Kian was here. He could tell us for sure. But I think what this thing does is it makes sure that you actually have enough funds in your, uh, in your account to pay the fees that you're going to owe for this transaction if it gets included. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it charges fees, but um, in the transaction, it allows you to include a tip as well. So you can kind of bump your priority by, by paying more than the required fee, the minimal required fee. Yeah, right. So that's something that's going to come up too later on in the, in the life cycle is this like uh, prioritization. Yeah, very, very nice. So I guess like Peter, to answer your question, if you know it's it's standardized because these all implement this trait that I might even have open somewhere uh, not this one but we can just look at it real quick um, signed extension yeah this is the one okay so SP runtime that's like the the primitive types for runtime developments and then it has all these useful traits and one of them is signed extension um, and so like if you want to include one of these uh, like uh, extended pieces of data and logic for your chain, you implement this trait, you can implement it like on a palette or just on a, a struct that you create anywhere you like, and then you would add it to this, to this list. So that's how those things get added. Or you, you know, you can also make this uh, like decision that, you know, I want my blockchain to be as simple as possible and the ability to replay transactions across different chains is like actually a cool thing or a feature or whatever. And then, you know, you just don't have to include whichever ones you don't want. In practice, when you do something like that, you know, like let's say, okay, I don't want this one or this one or this one, you know, for, for whatever reasons, you have to make sure that this you, your user agent whatever it is like you know probably something based on polka.js actually knows how to make the transactions so i i know that like there's an api for that i don't know exactly how to use it but i guess the, the point there is like you can make these changes in your node by commenting out or adding um additional checks like i just showed but then you have to somehow inform your user agent like yo know, when you're creating transactions either don't include this data or do include this new data or whatever so. That's great, thank you. Yeah. Okay, cool. So then once we've got our, our transaction created there, now we send it uh, to some blockchain node via an RPC or a remote procedure call. And Substrate comes with a bunch of RPCs out of the box and it also has the ability to like add your own if you wanna uh, you know, make a, a custom RPC for whatever reason. But the one where you submit transactions is, uh, is this one, author submit extrinsic. Um, and like, yeah, I guess since I just haven't said it yet, it's worth getting the, the vocab correct. So there's the general purpose word for pieces of information that come into the blockchain in substrate lingo is called extrinsic. 
And there's a couple different kinds of them. And like the, the most obvious one and the one that I've sort of like talked about so far is called a signed extrinsic, which is, you know, or yeah, a signed transaction, I guess. Um, it works basically the same as in Ethereum or, or Bitcoin. Um, and then the, the other one is unsigned extrinsic, which is where for whatever reason you don't have a signature on here and we'll, you know, maybe only talk about that when it becomes relevant. And then the third kind is called an inherent and that's for stuff that goes into the, uh, into each block because the block author puts it there. So like the, the classic example is the timestamp. So like some node is authoring a block, the runtime wants a notion of like, hey, what time is it when you author this? So the author of the block just gets to put that information in there and then, you know, other nodes will make some reasonable checks on it. Like it's not crazy far in the future, it's not before the previous block and then they'll accept it as true just because it's in there. So um, I'll probably use the words extrinsic and transaction like kind of interchangeably, even though that's not like totally correct. Uh, transactions are like one type of extrinsic. Okay, cool. So we sent our transaction into, uh, into one particular node. You know, you can think of it as like your node that's running locally, or you can think of it as, you know, somebody like Infura or some, somebody that offers a node that you're allowed to use. And so now that node knows about your transaction, whatever it is. And so it goes into the transaction pool, and then we're going to have to make some, like, some validation checks there. One thing that could easily happen is that your transaction is just declared invalid right away, uh, maybe because it doesn't like have, uh, you know, a, you, maybe you're trying to send some tokens and you don't have that many tokens, or maybe you're trying to vote in an election and you're not allowed to cast a vote in that election or something like that. And so like the green arrows represent uh, like, you know, ways that your transaction can sort of die an early death, like instead of living through the full life cycle. So it could just be considered invalid and sort of thrown away. Um, and then like I, I had this note here also that they're checked against the state and, uh, and I don't remember exactly what, what I meant by that. I know that like one example is that in a frame runtime, every account has this nonce. And so we need to say like, okay, some transaction just came into my pool. It has nonce six, but we already have uh, a transaction with nonce six in the chain. So it gets thrown away. Can't remember if I meant anything more by that at this point. Yeah, I have a question here. Sure. Uh, so in Ethereum, uh, basically, if, if if you send any transaction to the to uh, to a Ethereum full node, and it, it will just check your do some very basic checking. For example, your your signature, and if you have enough. Uh, gas to cover the transaction fee, but it, it will not going to uh, execute the transaction itself. It, it will just be included in the block first, and then uh, after the execution, after that you can know how is uh, it is uh, rejected or included in the blockchain. So I, I just want to know how is this happen in a substrate. Yeah, that's a good question. We, we definitely do have the notion of like this transaction got included in the block, but uh, it wasn't, you know, for, for whatever reason, like as it was being applied, it went down one of these execution paths where we said like, okay, we're going to make this thing a no op. Uh, I wonder like, Tomek, I wonder if you can explain more like what the hooks are for getting things validated, like at this phase where it's in the transaction pool versus like later when it's applied. Yeah, sure. Um, so yes, indeed we do some cheap checks very early, similar to Ethereum, where you have this hard coded checks that we are doing. So we are checking the nonce, we are checking the signature and so on. Here, uh, the transaction pool actually asks the runtime to do all the checks. So the transaction pool doesn't know anything about your extrinsic. It just tries to decode the, the, um, using whatever codec you are using, it's usually scale, but it tries to decode this row byte um, and then it passes this to your runtime. And the runtime uses this signed extension that uh, Joshi showed to actually validate everything. And when we execute a transaction, we can, um, I would say we can identify two different phases. Um, and there is something that is called dispatch 
which means that we actually run whatever it is in that transaction. So we actually execute the, the content of the transaction, I would say. And before doing dispatch, we do something that is called pre-dispatch, where we actually check if the transaction is okay to be executed. So the idea in, in Ethereum is that if, uh, sorry, uh, in Substrate is that uh, the transaction may fail during pre-dispatch, which means that we will reject it. We, we consider that invalid uh, and we won't include that transaction in a block. If it fails during dispatch, the transaction stays in a block, but it's marked as, as executed as, as failure. So we kind of uh, um, revert all the things that this transaction touched. Or do we? I don't remember exactly. Yeah, yeah but the, the mechanism is very similar to, to Ethereum. Yeah. In, in Substrate, I think you don't have that like uh, the revert like you do in Ethereum, but we have this like design principle that we try to hammer into everybody, which is like you have to do all of these, you know, verify first, right, last, like check every one of your preconditions first. And like if any one of them is, you know, not satisfied, then just bail, like, you know, mark it as this one didn't execute. Uh, and then otherwise, then you can start doing the mutations. Yeah, 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 yeah you're right. Yeah. I have a question that. Uh, when I was working, there were a lot of, uh, for example, in my case, uh, you cannot create two proofs and uh, two the same records in a, in, a, in a storage, right? So I throw the error, so I use ensure, and then the transaction fails. Mm -hmm. So is there is there any problem there is? Is there any way to get those failed transactions, kind of monitor these failed transactions? Because for some reason, some, if some uh, applications will be built on top of the chain, you will certainly like to know which application is just spamming the net, creating the, the same record all the time, right? Is there any way to get those failed transactions? Um, so, like, you can let's let's see. I want to show an example to give everybody the the context. So, like, we're in the substrate repo again, and then I'm just going to choose one of these, like maybe balances, because it's kind of a familiar one. This is the one for cryptocurrency. Let's see. I'm already in it. So, uh, so here's your classic, like, um, you know, transfer function. And so we, the first thing we do is like, make sure this thing is signed and that, oh yeah, we're going to call a, um, okay. That's not a good one. Sorry. Let me, let me find a, a more, let, let me look at pseudo. Um, so in the pseudo palette, we have this, uh, this transaction called, um, called this one, called pseudo. And we do this ensure check right here. Like we wanna make sure that only the person who, the only person who can call this, the only account who can call this is like the officially listed pseudo key. So Daniel, it sounds like you have something like, you know, the exact thing you're checking will be different, but similar, you're using this ensure macro. And like, this is the thing where at runtime, yes. then we're saying exactly. like, yeah, hey, we might mark this thing as invalid. It still goes in the block. Like it's actually still included in there, but then we don't go on to do any of this stuff that's gonna like, you know, mutate state or something like that. Yeah, I do exactly that. Yeah, but, cool. So in that case, in that case, the, uh, the transaction fails. And as you said, it's included in the block. So if yeah. I would ex inspect the block, yeah, I would see that transaction with the same error. Yeah, yeah. Like in this case, you know. But would it be? Would it be? For, but would it be also uh, kind of tied to a sender? Or would no? it be what tied to the sender? Yes. Would it, oh. would, would we be able to see like who actually which account? Yeah, yeah. Like you know, I I don't know exactly like how convenient you can get that in various formats, but like I know Polka Scan, for example, would be able to show you the complete transaction and who the caller was and all that kind of stuff. Maybe we can just look like. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure that the system palette is uh, placing an event and there is an extrinsic failed event that contains the error that you have. So you can correlate the extrinsic index with the event being in the, in the system palette. And then you know that that particular extrinsic failed, but I, I'm not sure if it includes the sender. I think it, it doesn't. Oh, you can pass that through an error, I suppose. So if your error, if your custom error uh, could have a parameter, which is the sender, then it will probably end up in the system dispatch fail. 
Yeah, that's yeah. cool. I actually didn't realize there was there was an event for that. But uh, yeah, I mean, so I don't know. I wonder if we'll be able to see one or if we'll be able to filter. So we can see like, okay, what call got made, staking on bond, staking validate, balance transfer. Oh yeah, so somehow they're grabbing whether this thing succeeded or not. Um, so like, so that data is available, definitely. Yeah. Um, okay, maybe I'll just go back to, to here and we can talk about more of that too. Um, okay, so like, I guess, let's say we make it through these like initial checks in the transaction pool. So, so far we've created a transaction, we've sent it over the wire to a node. It has passed the like cheaper initial checks and, uh, and now it's in the transaction pool, which basically means like, it's just sitting there waiting to be included in a block. And in the meantime, like, yeah, so one thing that I double checked for myself this morning was you can send this transaction to like any full node in the network. It doesn't even have to be like an authoring node. So, you know, like in proof of work, that would be like a miner or in proof of authority, that would be, you know, an authority or uh, in proof of stake, it would be like a validator. So you can send it to any node. And if you do send it to one of these non-authoring nodes, like you definitely need to get that transaction around to an authoring node somehow. And so it doesn't just sit there in the transaction pool of that one node you send it to, it actually gets gossiped over libp2p to the other nodes in the network. And so then it also enters their transaction pool. So now like when it gets to, when your transaction gets to a second node, once it got gossiped, the second node also has to perform all of these validation checks that the first node did because like, you know, in a decentralized network, you don't know who that first node was. They might not be following the protocol properly. So you really have to sort of check your own back. So it does all the same validation checks. Um, and so then it also, the other thing worth mentioning is like, once it's sitting around in these transaction pools, it gets prioritized. So um, in substrate, so like, yeah, you've probably heard about like the Bitcoin block size limit, which was a famous like debate in, in Bitcoin. And there's sort of like a similar, or like the gas limit in Ethereum is a, another way to think of it. So there's like a, a sort of similar or analogous thing in substrate, which is what we call the, the weight limit. And so each block can only fit so many transactions. And it's, it's not necessarily like a a specific number of transactions, it's more of like how much compute it can fit in a block. So like if you have some really heavy transactions that take a long time to compute, you can fit a few of them. And if you have like light, super fast transactions, then you, you can fit a bunch. But the point is there's some limit. And so given that there's a limit, if there's a whole bunch of transactions sitting in the pool, you need a way as a, as a node who's about to author a block, you need a way to say, okay, I have a ton of transactions. I can only fit so many. I'm going to pick these particular ones. And so um, like in Bitcoin, that happens because you just take like the, the fee divided by the byte length. And I'm not really sure how it happens in, in Ethereum, something to do with like higher gas prices, I think probably. Um, and in Substrate, it's abstracted away. There's this, there's this struct that I'll show you called uh, transaction validity. So let me just find it. Um, this one. So, oh, uh, sorry, valid transaction is what I was thinking of. So like we talked about how the pool does this like initial validation logic. And if it turns out that the transaction is valid, then it gives back one of these structs, which includes a, a whole bunch of stuff. Some of it will, we talked about already, like here's longevity, uh, minimum number of blocks, this thing, uh, where this validity is still correct. So like, um, you know, if we put 10 here, then that means we know this block is valid for at least 10 blocks. But after that, you might want to like revalidate because some, something might have changed. And then the one I'm talking about right now is, is this one, priority. And it's, it's like totally abstracted away. Different chains can have a different notion of priority. Um, and like in frame, I, this is another thing I learned for myself this morning. In frame run times, this is based on like the, the tip that's given uh, fee wise. So maybe I'll, maybe I'll just pause there for a second. Assuming that, you know, block fills up and, you know, you have to exclude some of the lowest priority. Um, I assume that they'll stick around and try to become included in the next block. 
Yeah, totally. Yep, totally. That's right. So like you take however many you can fit out of your transaction pool, the rest don't just get thrown away or whatever. They, they sit there and you know, uh, yeah, exactly. Next time okay. you author a block, you'll try to grab more of them and, and so on. Yep. Yeah. And, and that's like one of these arrows that I showed over here. Like it's possible that a transaction is, is valid, but it's low priority and it just sits in the pool long enough that eventually it becomes invalid. Maybe because like uh, we, we looked at that check era thing with the, the additional data. So you might have said like, hey, this thing's only valid until block 6,000. And then like it just sat in the transaction pool so long that block 6,000 elapsed and now this thing is stale. And so we, you know, it's not valid anymore. So we, we throw it away. How, how is the sender supposed to know when or if their transaction got picked out? Yeah. Is that listening to events again? Same thing. Yeah, good, good question. So there's this, uh, I, I don't know if this is a fully general answer, but this is one thing that I know exists. Like when you're using Polkadot.js to submit your transactions, you, you call this method called submit and watch. Which, which I've seen in the, in the Rust code too. And so you get back this stream of like, I don't even, honestly, I don't even know exactly what the data type of the thing you get back is, but it, it gives you updates about like, you know, this thing is now invalid or it was rejected because the priority was too low or, or whatever it is. So if you've submitted that way, you can get this information back to your front end or to your, I guess, more generally to your user agent. Oh yeah. There's also in sign, sign and submit in the, uh, in the JS API, uh, if you pass the third parameter as a, as a, as a callback function, you can, you can uh, get all the information the same. They are just events. So that's how I do it. I didn't know about this one, sub, submit and watch. Sign, sign and submit, is, uh, it accepts the third method as a callback. Yeah, yeah, cool. Third parameter is a callback function. Those, those so you can, you, can get, you can get all the stuff. Yeah. yeah, probably. Yeah. I have a lot of problems with that. It's not well documented, so it's... Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. The, so the JS API gets better documented every day, but it, it moves fast for sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, and it's, it's super powerful. Yeah. On the, on the RTC level, there is also watch extrinsic. So you don't have to submit it yourself. You can actually watch some other extrinsic that you know a hash of. And in the, in the Zoom group chat, I posted a link to transaction status, and which encodes all the possible things that you might receive over that stream. So you get information about, yeah, it's being broadcasted to peers, or it's in block now, it's waiting for finality, it's retracted, and so on. Is, uh, is, oh, this is the one you were talking about, I think, Tomek, right? Transaction status? Yeah. Cool. Oh, I've seen some of these come back in JS API too. So in block, that's like your, your success one. Um, I mean, it, it's partial success because it's, even if it's in block, it still might become retracted. You probably want to wait for finality. Yeah. Uh, and this is something we changed, like, I think within the, the last three months, because previously we were emitting an finalized event whenever the transaction just got into into a block. Now we actually track finality there as well. Yeah, I, I remember that. I, I used to have to explain to people like there's these different notions of finality. There's the one associated with grandpa and then there's the one that just means it's in a block and app says finalized when it means in block. So you, this is actually different now you're saying. Yeah, it, it got great. updated some time ago. Yeah. So the cool. good, so the proper exercise, like kind of a best, ex, best practice is to wait for the uh, for the finalized event on the uh, on the on the transaction status, right? Yeah, right. I think I think the way I would say it is like you you have to decide how final you want something to be and like understand just how final something something is here. So like, yeah, in block means it's in a block, it's in a ch the chain, it's being yeah. gossiped around, the nodes know about it, but it's possible that like a longer chain might come and you know sort of re change the history finalized is definitely a stronger guarantee, but even it is not totally like resistant to hard forks or something, you know, like if, if for whatever reason there's, there's drama and the network decides like we're going back six blocks and forking around that one. But yeah, I think this is probably the, uh, yeah, like the, the hardest guarantee. 
What yeah. is, I'm curious what this one is. Maximum number of finality watchers has been reached. Old watchers are being removed. Yeah, so the, the thing is that um, uh, your chain might not, it might not have finality gadget at all, and then you won't really receive finality events. Um, but also, like in the past, we have seen some issues with Grandpa uh, not finalizing block for a, a super long period of time. So if that would be the case, then on the node side, we would actually have to kind of queue up all, all of those finality notifications for all the transactions across this entire period of time where the, when the finality is lagging. So to kind of avoid depleting all the resources, we have some upper limit of how many uh, blocks we are tracking for finality. So if your finality gadget is, is really behind, then you might start receiving this finality timeout event, which says, yeah, we were waiting for finality, but it didn't come and we are not able to store any more. Uh, we are not able to track any more uh, blocks. So unfortunately, you have to resubscribe on your own uh, again with what extrinsic if you want want yeah, us to make sense. Listen. So it, it doesn't it means that it's not finalized yet. It might still get finalized or it might not or whatever. But like this, you're getting cut off from from notifications at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Usually it just indicates some issue with with finality in the chain. Yeah, cool. Um, interesting. Here's another one too. Usurped transaction has been replaced in the pool by another transaction that provides the same tags. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So like in a frame runtime, which is pretty similar to like how Ethereum transactions work, you can imagine like I use my account, I send some transaction with nonce a hundred. And then later I, I'm like, send another transaction, same account, same nonce but like, you know, higher fee or something like that. And so now the, the newer one replaces the, the old one in the queue. Oh, that was this green arrow, actually. Us I should have labeled that usurped. I called it replaced. So, yeah, so, okay, so great. So it's our transaction has now made it into the transaction pool. It's been validated not only by the node that received it, but by the other nodes that, re you know, received it over the gossip network. Um, and then eventually uh, it gets included in a block, which is, you know, one of the, one of the places we were hoping it would, it would get to. And so once it's included in a block, now it's sort of gossiped around the network again, but not by itself. This time it's the whole block and all the other extrinsics and like the block header that's being gossiped around all together as a, a bundle. And so now nodes are going to individually like um, apply this block to their state. So they go through, they execute each extrinsic. So now we're at the, now we're at the part where we may run into like to one of these things, like this transaction passed all of the cheaper preliminary checks in the transaction pool. It got included in a block, but now for whatever reason, you know, one of these insurers was uh, like, you know, was not met, I guess. And so um, it, it might be that we sort of bail early and, and you know, that's where this transaction sort of ends. Um, and so then like, this is something that I learned from Tomek a few months ago that I thought was really interesting because I, I sort of had this idea that when a block author puts a transaction into a block, then like they should take it out of the pool, right? It's moved on to the next phase, but that's actually not totally correct. What, ha what happens in general is that when you import a block, that's when it gets removed from the pool. And the reason we do it that way is because like the majority of the blocks that get created are not going to be your own blocks that you authored. And if you're a full node, none of them are going to be your own. So the, the proper time to take them out of the pool is when like, you know, when you've imported this block. So if you are the block author, then those things happen in sort of short order. Like you, you author your block, you gossip it around, and then you import your own block and, and pull those transactions out of the pool. Um, and then uh, this green arrow, like we sort of talked about it a little bit, but this is, the, this is the difference between in a block and finalized. And so the idea is, you know, just like we said, you might have, you might go into a block, but then a longer chain comes along and your block gets sort of like orphaned off or, you know, we reorganize away from your block. And so just because that happens doesn't mean that the transactions in that block are not valid. Like they, you know, they were valid. That's how they made it in a block in the first place. There's a good chance they're still valid. And so when a block gets orphaned off of the network, 
then uh, all of those transactions that were in the orphaned block go back into the pool and then you know they get reprioritized and then they hopefully will get to go into another block later on in the canonical chain. So in like in a crazy case, you know, you can you can imagine your your transaction is born up here and then it goes like two or three times around this cycle of getting included and orphaned and included and orphaned again. Um, and then, you know, it's going to keep going around that cycle forever or like sitting in this transaction pool until either it becomes stale or invalid and gets thrown away or until it finally makes it to like, you know, this sort of like final destination of, of becoming a finalized transaction. Is it possible to involve the offline workers at any point? Like, at, yeah, yes. the -chain but at which points can you involve them? Can you can you tap into each of these stages or just at the final one? So the off chain the off chain worker gets called. Let me just show some code of an example. There's this. Oh, in fact, I think Tomek, I think you wrote this code too. There's this like example off chain worker palette. This one. Um, and this is a good one to read through if you're curious about off-chain workers. Um, and it has this. So, okay, so here we're in our decal module macro. This is where you list like each transaction that you have in your palette. So like in sudo, we looked at that one that was just called sudo or in balances, we looked at one that was called uh, transfer, for example. And then like, you know, here's one in this example, like you'll have to read a little more to get all the, all the context. I think this is like a, a price oracle for off-chain price data. And then somewhere in here, boom, this is the one. Function off-chain worker. And so when you write a pallet to go in your runtime, you can optionally write this function called off-chain worker. You don't have to, but if you do, then your pallet provides an off-chain worker, which nodes can choose to run. And the time that they get run is like once per block. They get kicked off at on each block. And I'm not sure if it's at the beginning or the end of the block. Does anybody know the answer to that? Yeah, it's actually after the block is important. So when it's imported. Yeah, okay. because option workers run in parallel to block import. So it shouldn't affect like we don't wait for option workers before uh, we import a block or anything like that. So you import a block, you run the block, execute the block, and then import it to your local database. And then we trigger, that triggers uh, off-chain workers at that particular uh, block number. So if there's a reorg at that point, would, would, would the off-chain worker run twice? Or does it only run once the block is finalized? So that, no, no, so, so off-chain workers run on every block that is a new canonical block. Uh, there is an idea to actually run them for reorganize, like rerun them for reorganized blocks, um, but that, that's not the case currently. Um, and they also don't get information about finality. So that's something that we plan for off-chain workers 2.0, where off-chain workers are a little bit more customizable, I would say. So they can decide where, when they want to, when they want to run. Right now it's only, if we import a new canonical block. So it means that you can, uh, for instance, get option worker execution for blocks three, four, five, and then five again, because we reorg to a different five block. But we, we don't, even if three and four is different, we won't really um, like rerun them. Yeah, so we have a fork with three, four, five, and then another fork with three, four, or yeah, three, four, five, yeah, something like this. So like, so, okay, so I've got a, a question, I guess. So let's say my, my chain starts like this. So I run the off chain, I, I kick off the off chain workers. Like they, they might be long running. We don't know when they're going to end, but like I mm -hmm. kick off the off chain workers for block one, then two, then three, then four. Then like some new block comes in here, but this is not a con cannon block yet. Cause I've still got a longer chain. So this one doesn't run. Yeah. Right? Okay. Then we get another block. This is still not canon, but like, now we get this block, so now we've reorged to like the top chain. So now, do we run it for this all three of these new blocks? Nope, only for five. Oh, interesting. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, great. Well, I then, have a question. Oh, yeah, sorry, Joshi. That's okay. No, no, no. Right. So I'm trying to kind of you know wrap my head around like what would be actual use case for, this? for off chain workers? Yes. The yeah. 
the example one here is like a pretty classic example. It's like a, it's working as an Oracle. So like if you've ever heard of oracles in some capacity for off chain data, yeah. like that's one way. So like you can say at the end of the block, make a, you know, do whatever you have to do to get this data. Maybe you hit an HTTP endpoint, or maybe you have like some actual device here that like measures the weather data or whatever it is. And then a, a lot of times off chain workers do this. And if they're acting like oracles, then they definitely do this. Then they submit a transaction back to the chain that includes like whatever the result of that endpoint they queried or whatever the temperature they measured was or something like that. Oh, okay, right, right. So it's like, yeah. it's, it's Generally, it's like normal any kind of worker, you know, you know, in the programming world, right? So we just like run the worker, and you, you don't know when it's going to end up. Like, yeah, like, the, the beauty is like you don't have to have these really tight time constraints. Like I was talking about how weight quantifies like the execution time of a block. So if you want to run something that's going to take too long, you can still run that in an off-chain worker and just submit the result in a transaction whenever it's done, which might be like way later. Or you know, another good example is like everything that happens in the runtime has to be deterministic, which is to say like every node that runs the code has to get the same result. That's how we agree on like, you know, this thing was valid and it's our real chain. But if you're doing something like measuring weather data, you know, my temperature sensor might be calibrated slightly differently than yours. And like, that's totally okay for real science, but it's not okay from a like consensus standpoint. So you might, you, you might have something like that, you know, where we all submit the temperature we measured and then somehow like average or aggregate that data inside the runtime or something. Right, thanks. Yeah. Also, I think a, a super cool example is, um, this off-chain fragment that we have recently implemented. Ooh. So we have, uh, um, when, you are, when you have a proof of stake, you have validators and nominators, and these nominators can, can say, I trust these validators. But uh, in our case, we, we don't uh, distribute the stake equally because that's uh, a little bit inefficient. You can go into details a little bit more, but there is like this super interesting algorithm that is actually an optimization algorithm that runs in some random way and it's looking for a, for a local maximum of some, uh, some, um, uh, some goal function that, that it tries to optimize. And uh, we, th this is a process that can be run multiple times and can take uh, as much time as you want and you will just come up with a better and better solution. And this is not something that you can do on chain uh, because you are constrained with all those limits that Joshi mentioned. But uh, we have recently moved uh, this uh, election, this, this distribution uh, algorithm off chain so we can run it and then people can submit results and we can easily verify that these results are better than the ones that we have already. So that's a really interesting case for off chain workers that is actually in the code base already. Yeah, we had a seminar on that a few weeks ago. Kian came up. He's the guy who implemented the off-chain fragment and talked about what is fragment, what's the old way we used to do it in the runtime where it's like super constrained time-wise and what's the new way we're doing it off-chain. So yeah, that was a, a cool one too. Yeah, and then I, like I haven't actually seen an example of this, but one that I know people have talked about is like you can use an off-chain worker to do like crypto for you, you know, either be like a randomness source or like, you know, maybe manage some keys and sign stuff for you. Cause obviously you don't want your keys. Like, you know, you don't want consensus on your private keys. Cause that means people know them. So I, I haven't seen that in practice, but that's like something else you could do. Um, but then I guess also to relate this back to the transaction life cycle. So uh, let's see. So the block gets imported like somewhere around, where did that happen, I guess? I guess I didn't write it explicitly, but like this is the kind of the line where it gets imported. So we kick off the off-chain worker then, and then, you know, who knows how long it takes. Maybe it's fast and happens right away. Maybe it takes 10 minutes, but eventually, if your off-chain worker submits a transaction back to the chain, then that transaction goes through the exact same life cycle that we, we talked about. So like, oh, that's actually a good example of not using Polkadot.js as your user agent. Like the off-chain worker in that case is the user agent. And then, you know, that callback transaction goes through all these same processes, getting prioritized, maybe getting through this cycle a few times. So, yeah. Um, okay, so I, a couple other like related topics that I wanted to maybe talk about is we have this idea of like a tagged transaction pool, which I think is cool. And maybe I'll say my understanding and then Tomek, if you want, you can, you can add anything to it also. 
Um, but in general, I guess the idea is that transactions that you want to submit to a chain will depend on other transactions. So one simple way to look at that is in the Ethereum slash frame model where you have account nonces, the transaction that I submit with account nonce number like 10 depends on the one that has nonce number nine, which depends on the one that has nonce number eight. And so if the, if the queue gets my transaction with nonce number 10 and my one with nonce number nine is not yet in the chain, that doesn't mean that the, the number 10 nonce transaction is like invalid or should be thrown away, but it just means that it's not valid yet. Like we, you know, hopefully the, the transaction with nonce nine comes along and then they're both valid and they can both go in. Or like in, a, in another example, we, uh, we can talk about UTXOs. Like I know Nicole came on the seminar a few weeks ago and talked about UTXOs. And that's also the model that's used in Bitcoin. And so in that model, when you're transferring tokens, like it's, it's not a, a mapping from like account to balance and then Bob's account to his balance and Charlie's to his balance. It's more like individual tokens. And so like if I have a a UTXO or an unspent transaction output that's worth 50 tokens and I want to spend some of them, like maybe I want to send 30 of my 50 over to David. What I do is I actually destroy that UTXO that was worth 50 and I create two new UTXOs, one for David that's worth 30 and one for me that's worth 20. So then like you can imagine if David wants to spend some of his 30, obviously that transaction depends on the one where I paid him those 30. So the idea is that like, transactions can depend on other transactions and they can be dependencies of other future transactions. And so you have this like, uh, it's called a DAG or a directed acyclic graph. It's, it's a lot like a blockchain, except like, you know, um, you can have multiple parents and, and stuff like that. So you have this like dependency graph of transactions. And so the way we represent that in substrate is with this thing called um, like a tagged transaction pool. Uh, probably not a good idea to talk about it in the abstract anymore, but I, I think I have some code that I can show. This is the UTXO code. If you were here a few weeks ago, you've seen it. And, and if not, that's okay. I think I can just show you the interesting parts. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah, it's, it's here. So this is the, the palette that does that kind of logic that I just said, where it like destroys the old token and mints new ones that add up to the same value. Um, and somewhere in here, we have this, like this validate transaction and, oh, and like, just to tie it back to things we talked about earlier, you know, this is going to return one of those valid transaction, um, structs or, or an error. And, uh, so it's going to include like the priority and, and all that stuff that we talked about. So let's see, where do we, here's where we, here's where we return the valid transaction struct. So. You can see we give it the priority. We're like prioritizing these things in terms of the reward that goes to the miner who mines the block. So like, um, the, you know, the more tokens you're gonna give the miner, the higher priority they consider that transaction. But the part I was talking about just now is these two uh, fields, which is requires and provides. So basically what it means is like, whatever transaction we're processing right now, it tries to spend some UTXOs and mint some new ones. Well, it requires a bunch of other UTXOs, a bunch of previous transactions that mint the ones it's trying to spend. And so, you know, previously we went and we calculated them like I'm not going to, it's not worth diving into exactly how we calculated them, but like you can imagine we just loop through and see which ones are there. And so if they're, if they're not all present, if I'm trying to spend some, some tokens that haven't been minted yet, then we just say like, okay, this requires a few other transactions. And then we, the transaction pool does the same thing. It like sets it aside and waits to see if it, if it, you know, another transaction comes in that satisfies its, you know, its needs. And the way that you, um, the, the way that a transaction says like, Hey, I can, I create all of these new UTXOs that might free up some other ones that you previously like set aside. That's this provides one. So in general, what we're doing is we're saying like, we require all of these previous parent UTXOs that we're trying to spend and we provide all of these other new output ones that will free up some, some future transactions. Um, and the, the thing that I really like about it is that it is abstracted. So like most substrate runtimes use the, this frame model where it's all about nonces and that works great, but this one doesn't. And so we got to write our own custom logic in here that allows this like UTXO dependency and you know whatever other kinds of 
logic you might be able to dream up, you can also express the dependencies in that way. Oh yeah, cool. I guess we sort of took those two together. And so like the, the last thing I wanted to talk about here is inherent. So you might remember I said at the beginning, there's like a couple kinds of extrinsics. There's signed and unsigned transactions, which we pretty much have talked about the whole time. And then there's also these inherents. And so like inherents are just a little bit different because they don't really have this first stage where they're created by a user or something. Um, it's more like, oh, wow, I wonder how I would write it in here. They're definitely not submitted over, over an RPC. It's almost like they're, they just go directly into like this stage actually where someone's authoring a block and so they have to put in this inherent. Maybe it's the timestamp or like in proof of work, it's common that you would put in like the uh, address of the person who mined the block so that they can receive their rewards. So those kinds of things might be inherent and they just get put in by the author and then, uh, you know, validated in a entire block sort of fashion. And they don't, they don't have this property where they can like go back into the transaction pool. So like if you put a, an inherent in your block that says the time is like, okay, 10 58 AM or whatever. And then that block gets orphaned off then that inherent doesn't like go back into the pool so that a later block can say it's 10 58 a.m. They're just, they die with, with the block. So they have a slightly different path. Uh, I have a question here. Do you yeah, mean, sure. uh, do you mean the inheritance is just uh, the, 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 the so-called transaction uh, authored by the block author? Yeah, exactly. Well, okay, so it's it's possible that the block author also, you know, has their own like normal extrinsics that they're signing and submitting. Like that's perfectly valid. But there's a, a special kind of trans uh, kind of extrinsic called an inherent. And yeah, you you were right about that. It's like the block author just gets to submit it in each block that she authors. Got it. So it basically means that uh, not the normal users who can submit the inheritance to the blockchain. Exactly, yep, exactly right. Inherents don't come from like, you know, human users who are consuming the services that this blockchain provides. They come from the authors as like part of supporting the blockchain network. Part of their authoring responsibility is to include those inherents. Okay, thank you. Yeah, there's actually like a completely different mechanism that produces this inherent and, and um, yeah, just produces the inherent because when they are produced, they are we, we can't really distinguish them from other extrinsics. So they look like transactions, but uh, they are not gossiped over the network, and they there is a special right. place where they are produced and uh, included in the block. Yeah. So like the other day, we did this exercise, uh, or we at least talked about it. I don't think we did it live, where we like made a proof of work node, and so part of part of the like, okay, let's roll up our sleeves and wire in this proof of work algorithm is telling it like, okay, uh, proof of work algorithm, here's the list of inherents that my runtime is expecting and requiring. So it's your job to put those in every time you author a new block. So, so they, uh, they are, they're not gossiped around the network as transactions there, but they get gossiped like with the block that they're included in. They, they're only transported around with an entire block. So, yeah. So uh, I, I stopped the share because that's pretty much all I have to say about the transaction life cycle. I'd be happy to like talk about it more or learn about it more if anybody wants to, wants to share any ideas or anything. Yeah, okay. I was trying to find the, the mic button. Nice, okay, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have technically two questions. The one related to the bulk transactions, the one we were discussing, and uh, one about the better explanation of the weight. Oh, what, sure. I, yeah, because um, so it's technically kind of better. So I'm a very newbie in this, like five months. Let's put it like that. Okay, sure. Two months with Substrate. Okay. Cool. So the uh, so it's better to have less transactions, aka less space consumed, right? But Sometimes you would like to have a, one transaction per one record that you want to store in index storage, right? So the way how I'm doing the things, let's I'm creating a, uh, I have a set of some data uh, function in the decal module that produces some that takes in uh, I don't know, a rule set, some 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 rules, some operations, okay. some 
some arbitrary data. And it stores it in, uh, in, in one storage called rules in the Deco storage that, that, is, like, uh, that is a hash tuple. Like it has okay. a hash, and then it has a, some, uh, a tuple of data, account ID, and block number. So, and what I had a problem is that when I would create a bunch of them, so let's say like I, I even failed on three consecutive. So in a node, in Node.js, I would write map, just, you know, Here's the data. Just create five transactions in, like, to just queue okay. them, and it would it would fail with some error on wait. Uh, it was a peculiar, so I, I would implement that using some uh, set timeout of four seconds. That didn't work either, and then I realized that well, I actually have to wait for finality of it. So, and that's terribly slow. So for three transactions, three pieces of data. To store in a, in a in a storage, it would take me three times six. Yeah. Okay. So, so uh, is there any way to kind of speed that thing up? I was thinking to actually kind of create a separate function in the Docker module that would accept uh, an, a list of the same data. So it would have one transaction, but I would include. Uh, I would just yeah. You know, I, it my instinct storage. is so. Um, let's see if we can dig in a little bit. My, my instinct is that you you got some error indicating that you were doing something like you know wrong or like differently than what you intended to do, and now have tried to work around it in like kind of not quite the right way. So let me Probably. let me see if like if we just let's try to pin it down. Also, you're like welcome to share code or or something if you if you want to do that. But so basically, sure. you're sure everything is open source. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I mean, if you want to even like pull it up on the screen, we we could take a look. Like that's pure learning at its best. So, yep. so basically it sounds like you have some transaction and you want to submit like a bunch of them in like fairly quick succession, maybe not even like stupid quick, but like reasonably quick, you know, like not waiting 10 or 20 seconds between each one for, for sure. Right. Well, then, yeah, well, in a, in a month ago when I was testing out, so I would, you know, I would have like a Node.js, like a, just terminal app, just, you know, terminal, <laughs> Node.js app. Okay. I'll start with it because it's funny. Cool. Not to talk and not to not to see. Um, sure. <laughs> because you know, on one side I have the uh, the substrate part, mm -hmm. uh, like, and on another another hand I have Node.js. So technically, mm -hmm. what I'm what I was trying to do is a a called rule of this what we are trying what, what we are doing mm -hmm. uh, is like a it's, it's it's a set of operations that needs to be applied on top of any kind of data that is uh, for that rule set, and then you get proof. Okay. Not a single hash, you get a bunch of hashes that kind of describe the data. So it's different pieces of chunk data that rule actually sets in motion, right? So, uh, and you can have like, so I wanted to kind of create like uh, five different rules. Okay. I have it in, a, in, a, in an array and it's just like array of map, um, call the transaction and it, it's just gonna, you know, Create a you transaction. Wanted to, but yeah, it, you wanted to submit. You have a transaction. Yeah, that's, that's but like it failed. Or it whatever. You wanted to submit five rules real quick, and you struggled. Yeah, with that one, right. Yeah, yeah. Will, that's totally doable for sure. Yeah, show us your code. Let's let's dive in. Yeah, just let me just try to find it. Uh, here <laughs> is. No, I have like there's so much.